Welcome to this Let's Talk Decarbonisation Net Zero Week special with me, Matt Stadlin, and Sally Gunnell. She is, of course, an Olympic champion, a world champion, a Commonwealth champion, a European champion, and I'm really pleased to say as well, a Net Zero Week ambassador. Sally, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm honoured to be here. Before we get into Net Zero and saving the planet, could we just talk a little bit about your incredible athletics career? How much of your success do you put through to talent, put down to talent? How much down to hard work? Oh, do you know, it's, um, it's, it's always a difficult one, isn't it? It's that sort of, are you born with it? Is it nature, nurture? And I think a certain amount is, you know, you know you, you've got to have good genes. And I think both of my parents are sporty, but not outstanding. Um, but I think, you know, just your upbringing, you know, I was, you know, I've got two older brothers, quite competitive. I grew up in a very active sort of household, you know, with a farm, always playing outside, running around and all sorts of things like that. Um, and then found a very good coach from when I was 14 years old. So I think, you know, those certain things and yes, you've got to work hard, but you've got to have an amazing team of people around you. Uh, a bit of luck, I always say, when it comes to injuries and bits and pieces like that. Um, yeah, and a bit of belief and that mental side of it, which came in later on. Tell me a bit about the mental toughness when you're standing there in the, at the very beginning of a 400 metre hurdle final. I mean, it all comes down to this. All of that hard work, all of your God-given talents, everything is focused in, in, in those 30, 40, 50 seconds, whatever it is. How, how on earth do you stay strong at that point? Um, I think the, the mental attitude is something you have to learn. I think, you know, for many years, I probably thought everybody was better than me. And, you know, I used to crack under that sort of pressure. But, you know, I worked very much with a sports psychologist and we worked much more around yes. visualisation and belief and preparing yourself. So I knew by the time I got to that line, and even though I knew this was my moment, um, I wanted to be, I wanted to make the most of it. And I knew I was in great shape and I knew I had the best opportunity and I didn't want to waste it. And, you know, I think sometimes it is about, your, you know, putting it back down almost and say, look, you know, you can only ever do your best. And I trained hard, I mentally prepared myself and just give it your best shot. And if it doesn't work out, you pick up the pieces and I've got amazing people around me to, to pick me back up. So you just have to sort of rationalise it. But it is a really, really important chunk of it. And I would say as much as 70% of it is probably in the mind on those big days. And you were able to achieve something very special, which I hinted at in my introduction, which is consistency. Very few people, I'm not sure any Brits at all, have managed to hold the Olympic, World, European and Commonwealth titles in athletics at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the hardest thing is uh, that's sometimes something I admire in a lot of people that can sustain that excellence and being asked to deliver time out, you know, time in and time out. And I think that came down to, again, having a great pe set of people around me, team to, you know, make sure I wasn't getting injured, that bring my feet back down to ground almost, set myself my new t goals and tasks and just keep re-evaluating it. But again, just having great people that supported me and allowed me to, you know, to be the best version that I could be almost and, and just to see how fast I could get. That's what it was about. In recent Olympics, Britain has done brilliantly, hasn't it? Britain, Northern Ireland, absolutely brilliantly. It coming third, fourth, whatever it is in, in, the, in the table. But when you were hitting your peak, you were a standout athlete. There weren't so many top, top performers or medal winners. What was that like? How, how, how did that feel to be a top, tall poppy? Um, I think I think it was it was quite something really, and I think it's the reason why people still remember that night in Barcelona because there was really only five of us in those Olympics that won. I was the only woman as well, so you know compared to now where we have so many amazing performances, but there's so many names for people to to hang on to, and I guess you just became that household name really, and, and yeah, my life changed overnight people wanted to know where you what you're eating who you was getting married to all those sorts of things and it, and it was really quite amazing and I guess after that there was much more around 
you know, lottery funding. And, and that's really which came into in 1996 after the Atlanta Olympics, which really allowed, you know, us as a nation to, you know, com com to compete against the rest of the world and to come up there and third and fourth in the ranking and to have so many gold medalists because people became, you know, had an opportunity to do their sport. They didn't have to work and all those sorts of things. And I guess when I look back at, you know, my time I, I was in a great sport as in athletics was quite well supported in some sort of ways but you know I did work and um, I had lots of support from different individuals and um, yeah it was a different sort of time really but I think you did become that sort of household name from just being the only woman as well. There are ways and ways to use your household name status and one of the ways that you've chosen to use yours is to be an ambassador for Net Zero Week. Why did you decide to get involved? I think for me, it was, um, you know, it's become aware of it. You know, I'm a mum of three boys. Um, I live in a beautiful part of, of the country down in on the south coast. And, you know, all of a sudden, I've become much more aware around our environment, with that through news stories, just around climate change, about heat waves and flooding and, and all those sorts of things. And I, I'm thinking I want to do something about it. And I want my kids, kids to, to still be around and to still live the life that we're all so lucky to, to have. Is it something that you talk about with your friends? Is it something you talk about with your family, with your, with your boys? Oh, very much. Um, you know, we have made certain changes in the household that I make sure that they're part of and they understand what those changes are. But also, I think just understanding what the long term damage that it is doing to, to you know, our environment, to our world. And, and of course, there's so many programs now and I make sure as a family that even though the boys are a little bit older we, we still sit down and we watch what is happening and getting that understanding that we as a nation as, as individuals and how our kids and, and you know it is our kids that have got to make these changes as much as us um, can make a difference and I think from you know the clothes that they're wearing to recycling all those sorts of things can make such a big difference. A net zero week, do you feel that can make a difference just by raising awareness? Yes, very much so. And I think it's, you know, I think it's really important to have these weeks, you know, not just make it a whole year or whatever else, but I think just with, it's all of this is about education. It's about, um, you know, sometimes I talk about it when it's about, you know, being healthy. It's about helping and support people and educating this. And I think by having a net zero week is a week where we can all join together, you know, whether that's businesses, whether that's individuals, whether that's, you know, public figures, we, can, we have a voice. Um, and I think it is about educating people and getting some of those really important um, you know, just issues across and, and understanding. And, and sometimes it, it's doing it in a simple sort of way. And I think that's where I've come with it. You know, it wasn't something that was part of my life probably 10 years ago. And, you know, and I realised I can't change everything overnight. Um, but if we can make some small changes and understand them and pass on that message to individuals, it does go a long way. So education would be at the heart of getting the message out there. Very much so. I think it's about, um, for me, it's about wanting to be involved as a public figure and, and helping and support and educating. But it is about everybody around us, you know, just what, how we can educate people. And that is just about simple facts to uh, why we need to do this, what, what effect this will have, what the damage can be if we carry on, and just educating, educating, educating people. And are there ways in which you are making changes? You've, you've suggested that you are. Can you give us an example or two of, of the ways that you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint? Yeah, very much. I mean, I have got an electric car now. Um, we are planting lots of trees. We're, wor we're working with a the charity and planting quite a lot of trees. We've got, we've got, you know, a, a spare sort of like area of our garden, which we're making sure we do that. 
um, very much around uh, food waste and recycling all the time, making sure that everything is done that we can. And, and you know, and they're not massive things. I know that we're looking into ways that we can look at fueling our house. This has sort of been a bit of a long-term project, probably like with so many people and what changes that we can do and we're trying to get ahead around. So there are lots of little things that we're doing imminently, but we are looking to what we can do and implement in the next sort of, you know, four or five years moving on. And for other people who are watching this and who do look up to you as someone who's made a great success of your own career, what, what, what tips could you give them? Well, I think it's sometimes, it, you know, as I say, it doesn't have to be massive and it doesn't have to, you know, some areas does cost a lot of money and they don't, doesn't always have to be that. But I think little things like, you know, asking your energy supplier, what green tariffs they have out there, you know, making sure that you've got your lights are all LED, little things and they cost so much less as well. But, you know, 80% of it is, is, is much less energy that we'll be using if we just changed our light bulbs. And I think that's really good. Um, you know, change little thing looking at food waste I know this was a big thing when I've got three hungry boys um, it is food waste is something that I really look at when I'm you know busy mum as well making sure that I'm not throwing things away uh, we do try and eat much more plant veg I'm actually growing stuff in the garden now I think that's a good way of doing it um, and trying to get rid of meat as well because obviously that's not all always as good for the environment but uh, you know it's hard when you know we, we're very involved with sport and protein and all those sort of things so looking at different ways that we can get protein in and cutting back on our meat as well but all different ways of um yeah just looking at our carbon footprint and i think you know much more around cycling to places walking a lot more that we're all doing as well and i think that's all sort of simple things that that we can get our heads around i'm curious as well because you know elite sports so well and you've, you've been an olympian yourself do you think that climate change might impact elite sport might impact the olympics whether the summer olympics or the winter olympics we've already seen in, in the beijing winter olympics the struggles they had with snow of course whether or not that was caused by climate change do you think there are real problems moving forward i think very much so um yeah i mean you know if our environment is, is going to be getting hotter and hotter we're not going to be able to have the winter olympics you know it's as simple as that um and we're probably fine that, you know, we just have to do man-made snow and it's, and it's very, very different. And, um, you know, and I think that's one area. I think the Summer Olympics as well, I think we've noticed it now almost. It's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, and, you know, will that change? You know, because it does affect certain events you know when you when you're trying to run a marathon and, and the climate is getting hotter it's almost impossible for some nations unless they're probably african nations um so will they change that normally the olympics are sort of you know, july and august will they have to change the date to sort of you know september october or even bring it forward so yeah i think as an elite sport you, you do see it how it will affect and also you know when people are especially in those longer distances how hard that will be able to perform at those sort of high levels as well over marathons and things like that with that heat going up all the time just a final thought we know that the government has set a, a target of 2050 to become net zero in this country so much of your athletics career was built around targets, built around winning, built around becoming the number one, built, built around the Olympics, gearing up to, to something, going on a journey. What could we learn, do you think, from the tar sort of targets that you were able to, to manage and to reach in the end when it comes to fighting something like climate change collectively, trying to get to net zero by a particular point? Have you got any advice for all of us as a community i think the thing i had to learn is to have you can't just say right we're going we're starting here and we're going to jump to here it's you've got to know what's going to happen in between and what i'm going to put in place and i think it's that piece around just clarity in that vision and what we've got to do because your, your head and your mind cannot get round to you know, by 2050, we've got to be here unless we know what those steps are going to be and that we can actually, this is achievable to be able to do. I think the other thing is that you learn that you do have ups and downs and uh, there's going to be difficult moments, but 
Um, they're the pieces that challenge you. They're the pieces that make you who you are. And I think um, I think it's going to be the same with this. They're the ones that are going to make us think out the box, uh, be much more creative and think of other ways and, and allowing ourselves to, to reach closer to what we're trying to achieve in 2050. So I think it is But on those two points. It's just having that clarity and realising that there will be some struggles, but you never lose sight of what that end goal is and, and work together um, to get it. You can't do this on your own. You have to have people around you and support to get us to that point. Sally Gunnell, thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you.